My name's uh, Mike Bursell. Um, I work for Red Hat, and I'm one of the co-founders of the NARTS project with uh, Nathaniel McCallum. Uh, he can't be with us uh, here today, I'm afraid, so I'll be giving the talk. Um, as you've just heard, I, uh, I'll be answering questions at the end. Um, please do ask questions, and I'm going to try and leave lots of time to answer them. Um, it might make sense to uh, record the number of the slide if it, it's a slide, um, particular question you have about a slide. Otherwise, I'm just going to carry on through. So um, uh, welcome. So first, a bit about, about NRX. What is, what is it? What's it for? So the first is it uses trusted execution environments. Um, trusted execution environments uh, allow you to run processes, applications um, in uh, memory without um, with, with confidentiality and integrity protection. In other words, it allows you to uh, run workloads without the host being able to look in, without even if you have admin rights, uh, kernel rights, um, hypervisor rights, uh, they're still protected. So NARX uses TEs, and there's a number of those uh, currently available, SGX and SEV uh, from Intel and AMD, respectively. Um, uh, TDX is from Intel, not yet available, but it's been announced. Um, so these are chip level instructions, and that's what we use. Um, we aim to make it really easy to develop and to deploy workloads. Um, a number of the approaches uh, take an SDK route. We don't. Uh, we see ourselves as a, as a deployment um, framework rather than as a development framework. We strong, very strong uh, security design principles. Um, we, if in doubt, we take the hard view. We want to make it difficult for people to do the wrong thing. You can't make it impossible. We want to make it easy for people to do the right thing. Absolutely a cloud native approach. Um, our intent is to uh, integrate in the longer term with OpenShift and Kubernetes. Um, and it's open source, of course completely open source. And that's important. And I'll come to why that's important uh, later on. It is a project. It's not production ready at the moment. And it's part of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which is uh, a Linux Foundation uh, project. So first of all, let's talk about, about isolation and about workloads in the host. So we all know about the cloud. We all know a bit about virtualization. So let's think of a, a situation here. We have a, a tenant on the right. And they have a workload uh, on a, a host OS owned maybe by a CSP. And um, there may be other workloads from other uh, tenants on there. And of course, the, you know, the, the OS and all that sort of stuff sits around at the moment. So the first type of isolation uh, that we care about generally is workload from workload isolation. So you don't want other workloads interfering with your workload. Um, and Frankly, we're pretty good at that by now. This is something that standard virtualization, uh, either hardware or uh, sort of container based, is pretty good at stopping. The second type is host from workload isolation. So um, you don't want uh, a workload interfering with the host because if it can, you know, jump out of its VM uh, or you know get out of its C groups con uh, containers. It can do it can do bad things, and again, actually, we're pretty good at this. Uh, hardware virtualization uh, provides for this with hypervisors, but also C groups and SE Linux and uh, SecComp and all those sorts of things actually do a pretty good job of stopping this. But there's a third type, and that is workload from host isolation. And what if you do not fully trust the host? What if um, the, the host might itself be malicious, or you're worried about compromise? How can you stop your workload from being interfered by with the host? Stop the host peeking inside it, looking at your confidential data, even changing that data. Uh, the problem is at the moment with standard virtualization techniques, you can't. Standard uh, hypervisors, standard um, um, container models don't allow this because um, the way that they work is that the, the host uh, is in charge of um, mapping memory pages to uh, to the workload, and it can look in. Uh, so we we have a problem because there are lots of sensitive workloads uh, which really can't currently work on the cloud. 
um, or on edge or IoT devices because um, because of this problem. Uh, if you work in healthcare or finance or government or even in the enterprise, there's going to be workloads uh, that you should not be putting on a standard cloud because you cannot trust um, or your regulator doesn't feel that you can trust the cloud provider. So this is what trusted execution environments uh, attempt to fix. Uh, they do so in a variety of different ways, but the basic model is that um, the they are new chip level instructions which um, allow for the um, encryption of memory pages uh, which are associated with particular workloads and which uh, the rest of the uh, the OS, the hypervisor, the kernel cannot look into. Um, and that they are provided by in a set of variety of ways. And the standard ones at the moment are Intel SGX and uh, AMD's SEV. So these sound great, right? This is a great thing. Suddenly you can you can start running um, your uh, workloads in a way which means they they're protected. But well, the first thing is that um, if you're going to be doing this um, for SGX, which is the Intel version. Um, you're going to have to design your application in a, in a pretty much completely different way to uh, how you're going to do it for an AMD version. Um, and that's really painful. What, that's not how the cloud should work. You know, we should just be able to deploy applications, uh, we believe, um, and not care about the underlying hardware. So that's, that's tricky for a start. Um, and then most of the approaches... Uh, for doing this require you to write your application to a particular SDK. Um, and that restricts um, what languages you can be writing in. And most of them support C and C++. There's a bit of Java out there. Um, but there's some real issues with that. Again, we don't want to be restricting uh, what you write in. Now, this is a key one, different attestation models. So I haven't talked about attestation. Attestation is basically proving and checking that what you're running in is really what you think it is. So um, we're going to set up a, a trusted execution environment instance, a, a TE instance. Um, but how can you be sure that what you're about to put your sensitive application into is really protected in the ways that you think it should be? Well, the answer to that is attestation, and there are cryptographic protocols uh, to allow uh, uh, measurements to be made and checked. But the problem is that the different um, uh, models for doing this, SGX, um, uh, SEV, and some of the other things, are completely different. So if you want to, if you want to be putting your application into it, Either you're going to have to design your entire application to understand that, and applications shouldn't need to, or you're going to have to rejig how you deploy and do it differently for each of the different types of uh, TE you want to deploy into. And another thing, of course, is that um, if you have different vendors, what if vulnerabilities turn up? And they really have turned up, <laughs> quite a few of them. SGX is well known for having had some vulnerability issues. There have been some in SEV as well. Uh, and managing those uh, is, is tricky as well. What if you just want to deploy workloads? We've so, become so used to sort of OpenShift and Kubernetes and, uh, and OpenStack, just being able to deploy stuff. Um, and that's what we wanted to help you with uh, for NRX. So this is NRX, this is our logo, lovely logo, it's a shield. And here are the security principles. So the first thing that we care about is we take the security viewpoint that um, you should have the smallest trusted computing base that you can. The less you need to trust, the less there is to go wrong, the smaller the attack surface, the easier it is to, to audit. So um, we're trying to keep things nice and tight. The next thing is minimum trust relationships. So I said before, you know, you, um, you may not trust your host uh, provider, your CSP. Um, we don't feel you should need to. We should feel that the fewer number of trust relationships uh, you can manage, the easier it's going to be. <clears throat> we don't want you to have to recompile your app every time you want to deploy it onto a different platform. So we aim for deployment time portability. And we do that with uh, 
WebAssembly. And I'm going to come to WebAssembly in a moment. We keep the network stack outside the TCB. It makes it easier and safer. Um, we've known as a community and talked for a long time about security at rest, that's in storage, security in, trans in transit, uh, that's it on the network. But uh, security in use is what TEs are about and what confidential computing is about. But within our NRX, we want to provide uh, all three of those by default. Number six is auditability. If you're going to trust something, it needs to be auditable. Um, and number seven, open source helps with that significantly. Um, but also things about how you design it, how you uh, how you document your designs, how you allow people and encourage people to look at those is something that uh, we really care about. So number seven, open source, of course. And uh, number eight, open standards. We don't, I talked about SDKs. We don't want people to, ha to be having to, you know, compile to different standards. We uh, have chosen some uh, some open standards, uh, which uh, we feel that makes a lot more sense. Uh, memory safety, of course, um, because uh, we want to make it <laughs> difficult for things to go wrong. And we've committed as a uh, as a project to to no back doors. Now that's a lot easier, of course, because everything is open source. But we strongly believe that um, as soon as you start putting open doors and this sort of stuff, uh, things fall apart. So let's talk a bit about some of the choices we've made uh, in terms of uh, of technologies. <clears throat> so the first thing is we provide a runtime which is WebAssembly. So um, there are a number of ways of doing this. You could uh, do ELF binaries. You could do Java binaries. You could do something like a Docker um, container cryo type runtime. We've chosen WebAssembly for a variety of reasons. Um, highlighted here, firstly, um, that's a, it's a nice, uh, we can keep it nice and tight and small. Um, not too many trust relationships. One of the key things is, Deployment time portability. So um, WebAssembly is supported um, on uh, Intel, supported on AMD. Uh, there's good support coming uh, from places like ARM um, and from uh, IBM on some of their systems. And so that allows us to say, OK, you compile once and you deploy to wherever. Um, it's also nicely jittable, so it's nice and fast. Um, WebAssembly. Um, we're using a completely open source implementation or called WASM time as the runtime. So it's completely uh, auditable. And uh, WebAssembly is is an open standard. In fact, there's two. There's this, the, the core WebAssembly open uh, standard, um, which is a, a W3C standard now. And there's the WASI, which is the systems interface, kind of like headless, um, designed for server uses. Um, which is going through W3C at the moment. So uh, I'll show you a picture in a, in a couple of slides of, uh, of what our stack looks like and where WebAssembly fits in. We'll give you a bit more of a, of a clue how, to that, how it all fits together. We are writing um, almost everything in Rust. There's a few lines of, um, uh, there's a little bit of WebAssembly, uh, sorry, of assembly language, uh, I-86, uh, uh, WebAssembly, x86 WebAssembly, uh, sorry, assembly, x86 assembly in there as well, um, just for where we need to, because we're doing some pretty low level stuff like syscalls, which really need to be written like that. Um, but Rust gives us uh, deployment time portability. Again, it's very well supported. Um, and uh, it gives us, again, auditability. All of Rust is open source, and it's great for memory safety. If you haven't started playing with Rust, Yet, uh, I, I really encourage you to use this. A fantastic systems programming language. Uh, I came to it from Java, and it's oh, it's lovely. Uh, last one, I guess, shouldn't be too much of a surprise for most people attending this conference, at least. Um, but why open source? Well, minimum trusted computing base. Um, you know, we can make it uh, as small as we can. Open source, it's auditable, open source, open standards. And it also, as I said, allows us to uh, to show there are no back doors because anyone can look at the source. So um, let's go to here. This is a picture of the runtime architecture. So what we do in, uh, in NARCS 
is we deploy what we call a, a keep. And a keep uh, is like in castles. The keep is the, the bit in the middle, which is the safest bit, the place you keep all the most important things. And a keep is basically a trusted execution environment instance, a TE instance with a bunch of stuff in it. So let's let's look at it from the bottom. As I said at the beginning, um, there's a number of different ways of doing uh, trusted execution environments. You can kind of split them into two main types. One is process-based, and the other is VM-based. Um, and uh, SGX is an example of process-based, and, and SEV is, a, uh, is an example of a VM-based. But the key thing is, as I said, we don't think you should care when you're deploying workloads which you're in. So we abstract all that away completely with these WebAssembly and WASI um, uh, layers. So what you do is you get your application. And one of the nice things about WebAssembly is that there are lots of language bindings from WebAssembly. So it means you can compile to WebAssembly from lots of different languages, I should say. So if you're writing in C, C++, Java, Rust, Go, uh, .NET, Haskell, whatever, you can uh, just uh, compile your application just once and um, it will generate all the necessary language bindings. So what you're deploying is a .wasm file, which sits on top of the WASI uh, layer and just runs. So uh, we're going to see that in a minute, uh, in fact, in a demo. So uh, just an architectural view of, of all the different pieces. It's, it's very simplified, but this is what it looks like. On the left uh, in the keep is what I just showed you. Um, so the application sits on top of the NARCS runtime, uh, and that's the WebAssembly and all those little bits and pieces. On the right, we have the client. So we have something called the NARCS client agent, uh, and that is what is going to be integrated with your CLI or with your orchestrator, and that's what deploys your application over onto uh, the host. The host is untrusted. There's an NARCS host agent, which uh, is, is actually an untrusted uh, component, and I'm going to talk about how uh, how these fit together um, after the demo as well. But this is kind of what it looks like. On the right, you've got your client, and on your left, you've got your host. And basically, what you want to do is to get your your workload onto the host running in a keep without having to trust any of the bits of the host at all, apart from the CPU and firmware. Now, of course, you have to trust something because something's actually got to execute, and that is the CPU and firmware. And of course, those are cryptographically signed, and we're checking those as we go. Uh, this is a rather more complex view. Uh, I'm not going to go into this right now. We, we may return to it uh, a bit uh, if we have questions. It just talks about uh, all the different pieces. So um, let's, let's show a demo. I think that's a good plan at this point. So let's uh, see if we can make this work. OK. so. Um, this is uh, something I recorded uh, recently. And uh, on the left, we, uh, we're going to deploy something. So first of all, we need a workload. Um, we're going to take a, uh, a, a Rust application. Um, we'll just look at it. It's very simple. Um, yeah, there it goes. So what it does, it creates a random number, uh, formats it, waits 20 seconds, and then prints it. Very, very simple. It's written in Rust. And what we're going to do, we're going to build it, but we're going to build it as a WASM uh, application, as a WebAssembly application. So there, there we've just compiled it. It was that simple. We just gave it a different target. Now what we want to do is to deploy this using the client. So we need to point uh, the client, client at the file that we've just created. So uh, this is the .wasm file. There we go. And we need to tell it what host it should run on. So the host it's going to run on is an AMD machine called Rome SEV. And uh, where what port is it going to be listening on? So, OK, we've started up. We're on Rome. Uh, and we started on port 3030. So we're ready to listen. Right, we should deploy it. But before we do that, um, we need some way of getting the output. So we're going to use journal cuttle on Rome to see what's going on. Now, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to do an evil thing. We're going to see if we can look inside uh, and see what's going on. So we are just deploying the there. And 
we have deployed it. Oh, it's created a, a secret. That's fantastic. Let's see if we can look. Oh, dear. We looked inside it. I'm just going to stop for a moment and explain what's going on here. So what we did is we, we deployed a WebAssembly application onto a host. And then we had a very simple little um, program on the bottom right called Secret Search, which um, looked for the PID of that, um, that application that was running it uh, and did a search of the memory pages. And it looked for that formatted string, that formatted secret. And what's happened is it's found it. Now, that's a bad thing. Um, and let's just see if it was the correct one because uh, we have to wait 20 seconds. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show us. And there it is. Okay, so indeed, it found the right string. This is a bad thing. But this is how computing generally works. Um, so we did not put it in a keep. This is the key thing here. What we did is we did a nil keep. If you look at the top right, you'll see it's a nil keep. So it's running it just as a standard WebAssembly uh, application. So let's uh, let's change something a bit. What we're going to do is going to use Emacs, the king of editors, or the queen of editors, and change it from nil to uh, just a KVM. We're going to deploy a KVM uh, workload, and we're going to do exactly the same thing again. OK, it's created it. And this time, we're going to see, um, yeah, that's a KVM one. We're going to see whether or not um, we can look inside it. We're running the same secret search thing. Um, little application, see if we can look inside it. And um, let's see if we're any better with uh, with KVM. Oh, dear, it's found something. And in fact, it's found the secret. So what this tells us is, as I explained at the beginning, standard virtualization does not protect us from the host. Um, this uh, What we're looking at is not a privileged uh, process either down on the bottom right. It's just a standard process, which is looking at memory pages. Right. Let's uh, carry on, see if we can... Uh, do a, do a better job of this. So this time, <coughs> we're going to say we're going to deploy uh, a an SEV keep. So hopefully, this should actually uh, run it and run it in a T instance. So it's uh, it's doing it. It's actually done a fully attested. It's uh, encrypted the workload, sent the workload um, over the wire, put it into an SEV keep. Um, which should hopefully be encrypted. And hopefully this time on the bottom right, it will fail. Let's have a look, see if it's going to fail. It failed. Excellent. So the secret was never revealed. So what this means is that um, we've managed to avoid um, the, uh, the malicious process looking inside. So... And it shows that Enox has full end-to-end -end implementation. It's still early. It's still definitely proof of concept. We have a full end-to-end -end implementation of taking an application. Um, you can compile it using standard language tools and then deploying it to a fully attested keep. So the process flow looks like this. <clears throat> so first of all, number one on the right, the CLI talk to the client agent. And uh, it did an attestation. It asked um, the CPU and firmware via the NRX host agent, which just acts as a proxy, to set up uh, an application, uh, to set up a TEE. Once that was done, um, it, it checked um, the result of the measurement to check that it was true TEE, um, check that what was we're putting inside it is what we expected, use cryptographic uh, checks to do that, it then took that WebAssembly uh, binary, it encrypted it with a one-off session key uh, for that particular keep, and sent it um, to the uh, to the keep, which then ran it. So that's what's going on. Uh, for those of you who prefer this sort of view, uh, there's this. We'll uh, we'll make these slides available to anyone who wants to look at them uh, later on, of course. Um, so let me talk just a bit about uh, the project. Where are we? We have an end-to-end -end demo on SEV. The SGX one is very close. Um, we hope to have, well, it's now early February, so maybe it's a bit later than this. We hope to have a standalone uh, POC uh, so people can start playing with it, although the uh, the networking and storage will be, uh, will, will be restricted at this stage. 
And then we need to do some documentation. Um, <laughs> we've been running hard to get this demo uh, ready for you folks. Uh, and we've skimped a little on the uh, documentation, which I apologize. We are entirely open. The code is open. It's on GitHub. The wiki is and the design and all issues and PRs are open all on GitHub. Uh, the chat is on Rocket Chat. I'll give you the link to that in a minute. All of our CICD is open to, pe to members of the project in good standing. We have our standouts are open uh, and we've... Um, We've adopted the Contributor Covenant uh, Code of Conduct. Oh, seen that already. Um, so just to give you an idea of what we have and what we don't have, at least in, in POC, is here's all the different pieces. And the pieces in gray are the pieces that we haven't started working on yet. Um, we haven't started working on the attestation measurement database. Uh, that's We're doing a simple version uh, in a config file at the moment. Um, the keep runtime repository, uh, the contract manager, which is a, a piece for, for billing and those sorts of things. And on the bottom right, we haven't started working on uh, Kubernetes uh, or, or any other orchestrator imp, um, integration yet. Um, I'm going to uh, stop, I think, here. This is just a brief description of the different components, uh, if you're interested in looking at them, uh, and say, look, we really want you to get involved. Um, whether you want to be actually getting involved in you know, using the project um, as an end user or writing the project, um, uh, we'd love to, love to get, have you involved. Um, here are some of the, the, tool, the tool skill sets that we're really looking for. Um, most important is just willingness to learn, frankly. But if you have uh, particular skills in any of these, we would love, love to talk to you about it. We'd love to, uh, love to talk to you about that. Um, I will, this is the, the last, last slide, really. Um, this is where to find us. Um, please come along over to, uh, chat.enarx.dev, uh, and you can, uh, you can talk to us there. Um, all of the other things as well. Everything is under Apache 2.0, uh, and everything's in Rust with a smattering of, uh, 886, x86 assembly. Right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, um, stop, stop presenting if I can, uh, and um, take some questions. Right, folks, um, how are we doing? What have we got? Q&A. I don't see any questions at the moment. So any questions from anyone? I see one question. Uh, what's the performance penalty for all this uh, runtime plus keep? Seems like it could be a big hit. Yeah, interesting. So um, we don't have um, good figures for that yet, but not actually too high. So there's a number of places where where it, it turns up. Um, firstly, the process-based approach, the SGX approach, um, currently has a significantly higher performance penalty than uh, the VM-based. So the VM-based one, we would expect an encryption penalty of um, between 2 and 4%. There's of course other uh, hits that that may turn up in terms of you know web assembly etc. But that is heavily jitted, um, and we're not expecting things to be too bad, honestly, from what we're seeing at the moment. Um, and the deployment time is really quick, um, really fast. We were very pleased about that, um, partly because we're keeping things very small. Uh, so I'm maybe I'm looking in the wrong place for questions because I don't see any. Um, so um, maybe uh, a good thing to talk about a bit is uh, how we're managing. Well, may, yeah, what we what we have is a, a framework which um, we can. We decided to go with with WebAssembly, as I said, for a variety of reasons. It gives us some interesting security and capability management. Um, it doesn't leak things to the hosts. One of the questions we get asked a lot is, well, can I could I just run a container runtime in one of these? And the answer is you could, but the container, the expectations of container runtimes and execution environments generally is that actually there's a lot of inter interaction with the host. And that means that you're leaking information, quite a lot of information to the host every time you're running. So um, we made a decision that for security's sake, 
um, we wouldn't support standard container runtimes, and get, we would go with uh, WebAssembly instead. Now, the intention is that um, we uh, we would do integrations with uh, Kubernetes, for instance, and OpenShift in such a way that um, typically you'll be you'll be writing microservices to to run in these uh, these things. You'll take your most uh, sensitive data, your most sensitive um, workloads write microservices and deploy them and uh, the intention is that you know you we would provide a a way of deploying uh, keeps in the same way that you know kubernetes knows how to deploy serverless and vms and containers and we'd hope that keeps would be another another way another thing that it could can uh, could do so there's bits and pieces like the attestations very important to get right as well um so you know the intention would be you have an application you know it's got three VMs, um, 15 containers, maybe a couple of keeps. You write an operator for how you deploy and manage uh, all of those different pieces and how they fit together, and you deploy it like that. So it becomes actually very uh, very low, uh, low maintenance and, and easy to run. That's a question that comes up quite a lot. Uh, any other questions from anyone? I either gave the perfect um, uh, presentation and I, I explained everything perfectly or I did a very bad job and explained it so badly no one has any questions they don't understand. I, uh, <laughs> I, I suspect it's somewhere in the middle uh, of those. How can you, how yeah, can you trust ahead. your CPU? Because, you know, for me as a software person, I sort of look at hardware with suspicion and if somebody says, okay, the basis for all the transit infrastructure is essentially hidden in hardware, well, I get suspicious. Something went wrong. Please try. Yeah, absolutely. So it, that's, a, that's a very, very good and very difficult question. The answer is something needs to execute instructions, and that's got to be hardware, right? Now, I would be overjoyed if um, that hardware were open sourced. And you know, if you look at some of the work that IBM is doing with power, if you look at some of the work that's happening in Risk Five at the moment, actually we're getting closer to some of that. Um, it's still a while away, and let's not pretend that Intel or AMD are doing much of that. But um, you have to choose to trust something because something is going to be doing the execution. So um, we have to, we will we want to reduce the number of things you trust and. That's going to have to be one of them for now until it's fully open. Entirely fair question. I wish I wish everything was open and more trustable, but at least we're reducing. You know, if you don't have to trust the host OS, the host, uh, you know, host firmware, apart from that one piece of firmware for the CPU, if you've reduced that, your trust, trusted compute base and your attack surface is so, so much smaller than it would be uh, in other cases. And this is, there is no perfect security, right? There's, it's just impossible. What we can do is make it as small as possible and defined as possible. Uh, and that's, that's what we aim to do. Cool, still got a few more minutes if anyone, uh, if anyone has anything. Um, I tell you what, I'll go back to uh, to my slides and I'll just show you um, the this one here to look at the different pieces that that we make up. Maybe it'll give you a slightly better idea of what's going on. So um, this the the white thing here is basically uh, what um, what we deploy. Um, and it's made up of a number of pieces. The pieces in the sort of pink color, this light color here, are untrusted. The ones that sit in the green area are sitting in the uh, in the keep, in the trusted execution environment itself. We have a shim here, and the shim is different um, for each implementation. So SGX has a different shim to SEV. When TDX comes out, that'll have a different shim, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a code layer with a WASM layer and the app loader. So basically, we, we bring this up. We um, perform the attestation, which is done by the client over here. And then the app loader 
waits for the client to send the encrypted uh, workload, which is the application up here, which uh, which it then runs. Um, and as I said before, um, we have a different session key uh, for every single keep instance. So this keep here would have a different session key to this keep here, for instance, even if they're owned by the same uh, by the same client, uh, by the same tenant. Um, there's other pieces here. So this is the keep manager. That's basically a daemon that uh, waits for connections from clients uh, and sets up uh, these the keep loader, which then uh, builds the rest of it. Um, we may be changing this slightly, so I won't talk about that. This is uh, a repository of, of what you want to be uh, deploying. Uh, and this is what the client needs to check for the attestation. So uh, the attestation will be different for each, but um, we will keep measurements to uh, so that we can prove to ourselves, have strong assurances to the client agent uh, that what we're deploying to is cryptographically proven to be a, a true TE. That's just a bit more about, uh, about that. Wow. So my, okay, so um, so the keep back. repository yep. which sits between the uh, main environment and the client is is that encrypted, or it shares uh, data? So variety variety of ways of doing that. Um, so the answer is it it can be. Um, it's basically it's similar to your container repository. So it may be that actually yes, you want to encrypt that, and we can we can support that absolutely. But on the other hand, it may just be a, a well known repository of of standard standard uh, things that you want to deploy and which don't need to be encrypted. So uh, yes, if the algorithms, you know, if the application itself is sensitive, you know, maybe you've got AI modeling or pharma stuff in there, um, whatever, then that can indeed be encrypted. Um, but otherwise, it, it may be it's a standard type of, of, of repo, which you don't need to. So there's a variety of models there, which, frankly, that was a complicated enough picture as it was uh, without trying to explain some of the different trust models that, that we support and we will be supporting. So I just a last thing is I want to really encourage people to get involved. Um, we're currently not funded. We don't have engineering effort funded um, by Red Hat or anybody else. So this is very much a spare time project that funding finished at the at the end of January. So we really want to be uh, getting this on. We're looking for alternative ways of, of getting it funded. It's an open source project. It's part of the uh, Confidential Computing Consortium, which, as I said before, is a Linux Foundation project. Um, it's very easy to get involved. Uh, come along and, and see us. Um, uh, we are we are here on the. Uh, uh, chat.nrx.dev and we would um yeah we'd love to love to speak to you so um thanks very much indeed for for your time thanks to uh sumed and uh, jiri for uh, setting this all up it's great really appreciate it have a great time in well not bruno wherever you are Mike. keep safe <laughs>